Hello City Life. As you receive this, I'm on holiday in Spain at the moment and um, I hope you enjoy this. It's a, a topic very close to my heart and so and there's plenty of things for you to think and consider within these notes um, and uh, therefore I am supplying those full notes so that you can take some time after this because I'll probably be moving through quite quickly today. It's our second series on our talk on uh, hearing God, our theme of hearing God. An important teaching theme, especially as City Life is on a relatively unknown journey. Um, a, journey a journey that we know he intends to bring us passionately in love with Jesus, um, passionately in love again with his mission to disciple those both inside and outside the church, to raise us up as those priests that stand between him and others that don't yet know him. Um, so it's very important we try and hear God at this time, isn't it? And I know some of us think maybe we can't hear God um, but hopefully some of these teachings will give you um, certainly the confirmation that there is a God who speaks today and he wants to speak to you and I and that there's various ways that he can do that, that we can tune in. And I, I really do hope it expands um, our understanding of just how creative God can be in speaking to us in these different ways. But of course, the way that Paul spoke to us about from the Bible, um, everything has to be underpinned by those scriptural references and truths that uh, we find in the Bible. So, But Brother Lawrence said, there is not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than that of a continuous conversation with God. So we're hoping to encourage that. As I say, when Paul spoke last time about the main way God speaks to us through the Bible, um, we definitely, that's definitely true. And we're without the excuse here in, in England, aren't we? Because Let's face it, everybody has access to a Bible here. That's not the case in some other places, obviously. But we have his written word. And as Pete Gregg says, the Bible is the language of God's heart and nothing he says in other ways and context will ever contradict God's written word. And it's important we remember that. We remember the God of the Bible, his character, his nature, his ways, as we look at this next way of hearing God that I want to talk about today, that I'm excited to talk about today. And that's God speaking to us through our inner thoughts and our imaginations. I'm currently reading a book at the moment recommended by the lovely Jim Clark called Unfettered, Imagining a Childlike Faith Beyond the Baggage of Western Culture. I thought, well, that's me. It's speaking into so much of God's, what God's been saying and doing with me, bringing me back to this childlike dependence, bringing us all back to this childlike dependence on him when we find ourselves on this journey that we're on. And it seems a very radical time and an exciting time in many ways uh, in terms of what God can do with our hearts and our imaginations at this time. One of the main things the book points out is that many have lost the childlike ways of encountering and relating to God, relying primarily on adult intellect and reason and understanding rather than our instincts and senses and imaginations, which children obviously use a lot. The writer Mandy Smith makes this point. Bible characters are very whole, not fragmented, very human and comfortable with their thinking, feeling and sensing of human experience. Scripture uses language for soul, spirit, mind, stomach, heart and breast without creating hard categories and hierarchies. When Jesus calls us to love God with all our mind, soul, heart and strength, like he does in Mark 12 and Luke 10, he's describing an engagement involving our whole selves and God engaging with us with his whole self. So I want to suggest that recovering our childlike selves so we engage God with our adult and childlikeness rather than childish or adultishness will involve awareness and response to inner prompts and imaginations. Every human being is give, given the gift of an imagination from God. It's one of the things that separates us from the rest of the animal world. It's one of the things that shows we're made in his image because he has the best imagination ever. Not only did God make every one of us unique and different from each other, he made the duckbill platypus, the elephant, the flamingo, the octopus, displaying mind-blowing creativity and imagination. Everything in the earth's structures and heavens, every plant and animal except humans, he pictured in his mind, in his imagination, and then spoke them into being. Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what was seen was not made out of things that are visible. I love that one. It's quite a controversial one, I should imagine, with some. 
I love it. It was coming from the imagination of the creator. David in Psalm 33, inspired by the spirit and using his imaginative gift, spoke about God's creativity saying, the Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. This is imaginative inspiration at its best, bringing us deeper truths about God, causing us to worship in wonder and gratitude for all he is and all he's done. And the first job that God ever gave human beings after creating them like himself was to name all the amazing diverse creatures that God had made. In Genesis 2, we see him telling Adam to go ahead and name all those created animals. Now I have to say, duckbill platypus, Adam, what were you thinking? Strange name, but they are cute. God, God grows our understanding of who he is and what he's capable of through our imaginations coupled with his words. He gets us thinking and imagining and then he still surprises us. Ephesians 3.20 in the message says this, God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest of dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us his spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the church. When we use our imaginations, when we get in touch with this creator God and his spirit moves us, lots of things are possible. His co-labouring with us, his power indwelling us, makes us capable of bringing about great imaginative acts, great creativity and bringing great glory to God beyond our natural, wildest thoughts and possibilities. And one very important thing to say is this, that imagination is not the opposite or the enemy of truth and reality. We don't have to ignore our brains to imagine new possibilities. In fact, the dictionary defines imagination as the ability to form new ideas, to visualise and be hopeful of a reality that goes beyond our experience, impacting the limits of what we know is possible. Imagination partners with faith as God gives us new ideas and images that help us feel and believe for new things, changing our hearts, inspiring different actions in us. The writer Ted Lota said this, imagination is the dancing partner of faith. His words captured my attention and I could imagine the dance I started to write. Watching them move together brought a stunned silence a captivated hush as every breath was held, a silent gasp played on lips, hearts beat in every chest, lungs swelled as if they might burst with something between exhilaration and awe. Enmeshed and entwined as one, they glided over the landscape, taking it in turns to lift each other over obstacles in their way, nothing able to stop their dance or the music that only they could hear. At times, one propelled the other into the air, releasing hold for an instant to allow for a full leap of faith. Legs extended, toes pointed, head up, eyes on greater things to come. Then catching each other up, embracing each other again, twirling, whirling and spinning forward into a future known only to the master choreographer, the creator and crafter of their dance, the one who has ordered their steps and whose presence is their song. How can we see our faith grow through our redeemed imaginations? How can our imaginations spur us to take leaps of faith while trusting in the one who's prepared this dance for us? That's my question. We need to start using our imaginations for the glory of God, beginning with baby steps, and then anything might be possible. We can start by spending time in the Bible and in creation, pondering the wonders of creation, fuels worship as we see in the Psalms. And the parables in the Bible show us that Jesus's creativity is fantastic at getting people to imagine the supernatural kingdom of God in the context of everyday things. And he can still do that for us. He spoke of yeast and dough, lost coins and sheep. But the stories provided connecting points for changing attitudes and behaviours. And that's why Jesus would sometimes end a parable with the words, go and do likewise, like he did in the Good Samaritan. 
and practicing Lectio Divina, reflecting on a verse or passage, letting it open up to us and in our imaginations helps God deepen the meaning and use it to bring fresh application for our lives. So we could start there. American theologian Jonathan Edwards believed God has built deep truths into nature. And I'm sure that's true, isn't it? He saw in the butterfly the burial and resurrection of Jesus. In the sunrise, the eclipse of the law of works by the more perfect law of grace. His godly imagination deeply reinforced spiritual truths and drew him closer to God. One of my favourites, the nun, Macrina Weidecker, says, Holiness comes wrapped in the ordinary. There are burning bushes all around us. Every tree is full of angels. Hidden beauty is waiting in every crumb if we are willing to stay long enough to unwrap the ordinary. We will harvest its treasure if we do. We know that children pause and explore moments that come to them. You can feel like that sometimes when you're trying to take them along the road somewhere. It takes forever to get the shortest distance. They're not in a rush. They just take in every moment that comes to them. And if we're to notice new ways of encountering God, we are to be like God's children. We must give time to pay attention to moments that come to us. Mandy Smith says, this is a moment to embrace small things, allowing ears to listen to birdsong before launching out of bed to do something important. Savouring the smell of hot coffee, lingering on a word, snagging our hearts when reading the Bible. Touching, touching a wooden tabletop to feel its grain, stopping to look at a cloud formation. This kind of openness and responsiveness transforms how we engage with the word, opening our eyes to truth beyond our understanding. We have permission to approach life as an adult who is as open as a child. We can engage as whole beings by being open to a God who speaks through scripture, music, conversation, imaginative ideas, feelings, intellect, nature and bodily experience. These moments allow us to connect with God in ways we might not be used to, but they are not frivolous or a waste of time. They are additional ways to have a richer experience of his presence that I believe he's longing for us to find. And that's what I'm on a bit of a journey with. Imagining the scriptures also deepens the incarnation that they can have in us. For example, we can imagine God's promises. I've had problems sleeping in my latter years, terrible sleep. And yet God's word says in Psalm 127, verse 2, It's useless to rise early and go to bed late and work your fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? I've been trying to imagine receiving the gift of sleep from God. Wrapped up, placed in my hands received and opened by me as my head touches the pillow. I am a work in progress in this respect and I will persevere. Sometimes when I'm preparing a talk, I imagine myself saying things, saying it before you, saying it before others. Maybe I haven't finished writing it or something's just sticking with me, but the words begin to sort of subconsciously stay with me and I start imagining myself before people saying them and somehow it makes me feel that more confident that God's going to touch people through them or just more confident that they're going to be really heard or caused expectation and excitement. I'm not going to admit of course whether I had that with this talk, I'll have to leave that to you. Artists, poets, musicians and other creatives use godly imagination and these created works and masterpieces can seem almost inhabited by the Spirit of God like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, speaking to other people's hearts all the time of the things of God. When our imaginations and godly purpose come together, our faith, motivation, courage and understanding of God's capabilities are all ignited. We can worry about having overactive imaginations, but I think a lack of imagination is a far worse thing. It's true that imagination, if not redeemed, can be used for terrible things and great evil. But once renewed, it functions as God's visionary organ, and he always intended it to be that way for his children. Patricia King's MP3 Teachings in Glory School, which we do heartily recommend at this time alongside this series, say we must set our minds apart to hear God, keeping our minds pure. Our minds were created for this, not carnal thinking. We must train them to focus on him so we can learn to discern his voice, spending time, asking questions, checking answers out with the Bible. 
the eyes of our imagination or a faculty of our soul that was created to receive heavenly vision. It's our visionary organ and no kingdom visions come without it. Visions of God are imprinted there. And remember, if you see it, you can have it. And Pete Gregg says in his recent book, How to Hear God, any revelation that claims to be from God but doesn't sound like Jesus and fails to push us deeper into relationship with him is not Christian, no matter how supernatural it seems or how many Bible verses it's got wrapped around it. Wise words from these two people. So as we practice, let's remember these wise words and always begin any conversation with God and any imaginings with God by praying that he leads and guides us by his Holy Spirit and keeps us in alignment with the truth we know of him from the word, from the Bible. One thing I discovered last year was something I call free writing. I was reading the Prophetic Warrior book by Emma Stark and she gave us an exercise to do. We were to ask God about something we were concerned about or had a question about and we were to just immediately, without pausing to think or stop or reflect, just write with flow what, come to, which came, what came to us after we put it to God. And I was on a train at the time and felt very unready for such an exercise, but I decided I better go for it. And I just literally tapped out on my computer, whatever came, just without even really thinking, whatever came to me after I'd asked God a question or a concern I had at the time, asking him about that. And a few minutes later, about three minutes later, I naturally stopped. When I read back what I had written, I, it was so spot on and significant, it's really stayed with me. God told me not to be concerned that I was feeling empty, that I was being emptied for purpose and I would be refilled. He told me I was not to question, worry, compare with others or try to understand, only to trust. I underlined the commands there. Sometimes it's good to do that. Underline the commands because I've had to come back to that time and time again when I find myself wondering what's going on. Don't question, don't worry, don't compare, don't try and understand. So I'm still on this journey. The emptying and the waiting continue, but I hope and trust on a good day for the refilling of God's spirit. that He plans to move powerfully amongst us. I do believe that. And in line with what I've already shared on the subject of moments at the beginning of 2022, God told me to look for moments and not always be focused on big breakthroughs all the time. Just seeing his hand in the little things and in the ordinary things. And it's so been it's so encouraging to read this book and these other things since then because it's just reinforced what God said to me at the beginning of the year. So I've started, I think I've already shared with some of you about the winking game I had with mum as one of those special moments with chronic dementia and no conversation. This was a gift of God for me. Also sitting there with my grandson twirling my hair whilst I give him his bottle, that's another moment that I find God in. But recently, God's been talking to me through cranes. I'm just going to share two things he said so that you can weigh them. And then I shall be signing off. So, leaving London a few weeks ago, I noticed near Charlie and Dan's home, a cluster of seven cranes. Their long shafts and metallic arms piercing the urban skyline. They stand imposingly, but there was no life in them. They're made to move and shift large weights with their higher vision and perspective to precisely manoeuvre things needed for building and enlargement into place. Yet their crow's nest-like cabins remained empty day after day, leaving them impotent, a feat of engineering and a lattice of costly materials like church spires on buildings once used for worship for the one who created the skies. They perforate the sky, but... They've just now gone to the highest bidder for a lesser calling. And it was the same with these cranes. They've been called to something and they just weren't doing it. I found myself with questions to talk about with God. Who will climb the steps? Courage in heart, higher and higher to that place where anything can happen. Once seated in that tiny capsule heart in the sky, they can liberate the power of the mineral creatures, release its vast reach across the land, shift weights in the way of construction, carry in resources with pinpoint accuracy for building. What is the meaning of this modern day parable, I said to God? What can be achieved with these seven masterpieces working in unison with common strategy and purpose under an architect's direction? What's he wanting us to know? My imagination and reflection before God gave me some possibilities. Maybe it's any one of these or all of them. Maybe this is seven, which is a perfect number in the Bible. 
churches working together in our city and we're one of them and maybe the leaders are those who should take courage and climb to new heights with new vision and perspective to see the land transformed inhabited by God's kingdom rather than trying to stand tall on our, on our own patch with nothing lasting being built no matter how impressive we look. Maybe this is seven individuals called to work together on an aspect of our city or the church's reconstruction. Well, maybe it's seven individuals who need to let the small whisper of God guide their hearts and actions again, inviting him to position them himself and take that central place of control of their destinies and direction, letting him become once again the architect of their lives and of their families and church family. Without him, they're left standing still, present but not purposed, nor powerful nor far-reaching, with no sign of the kingdom of God growing and being put on display for the glory of God. Maybe God speaking to us. Four days later, I was sitting in the waiting room at Southampton Station. I noticed a different type of crane, a white origami paper crane on the window ledge of the waiting room looking out. I felt it was another moment that God wanted me to notice and speak to him about using my inner thoughts and imagination. The white crane reminded me of the Holy Spirit waiting to be released outside, but trapped inside the building and structure. He wants to migrate, he take us up higher to new lands, but we must notice him, gently embrace him into our hearts and lives and carry him into the world with us. There is a lament at his entrapment, but there's a new dance to be found. And I picked up that little crane and took it out of its waiting room on the train with me. I've still got it. I leave these for our weighing and our prayers, but let me end by saying that Christian imagination helps us see beyond the material world to the deeper meaning of the things of God, regarding his person and his purpose in the world. His relationship with us individually and corporately, it speaks into all of these. It's time to redeem and use this precious gift. Maybe we should ask God for a few moments of our own. I'm going to just end with two quotes, one from, again, from Unfettered, which I now show you the slide of the book so you can all go out and hurry and order yourself one. I can't recommend it enough. Learning to receive the warmth of the sun I had not formed on a shoulder I had not shaped, or receiving the juice of a ripe cherry I had not made, with taste buds I had not invented, was practice for receiving the kingdom of God. Letting a word from a psalm sink into my soul, allowing my heart to say amen to an ancient prayer. All this was practice in keeping my eyes, ears and heart open for things beyond me that were always at hand. These moments offer opportunities for humans to practice how to be receptive to God. Sometimes it leads to moments of wonder. Sometimes it troubles us with things that aren't right in us or in the world. How can we rediscover that childlike capacity for the real? she says. And Walter Brueggemann speaks of the great call of prophetic imagination and ministry to bring to public expression those very hopes and yearnings that have been denied so long and suppressed so deeply that we no longer know they are there. Well, it's time to recover them. Mandy says, we long to have institutions, power, measurable effects, named leaders, buildings, resources we can count, outcomes we can report, but perhaps it's our organic nature that makes the kingdom truly transformational and unstoppable. The kingdom has prevailed because it exists in human hearts and in relationship between God and human and between one human and another. The spirit in us requires no institution and looks for every chance to move, flourishing where there is opportunity, redirecting where there is not. Every place the spirit fills becomes our beautiful, dancing, unhindered ecclesia, welcoming, nourishing and healing. As I say, these quotes are all in my full notes, which are available so that you can go over them, and let them sink in a bit. That being said, let's open ourselves up to the opportunities God is wanting us to have to encounter him with our redeemed body, souls and spirits in deeper, creative ways. Let's release and pay attention to the childlike prompts, imaginings and responses that we can receive and the richness of his presence as adults that we can begin to have as we are open to being childlike. So let's pray. I'm praying using Ephesians 1, 7, 17 and 18. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you and me the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, 
having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we may know what is the hope to which he has called us, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Oh Lord, we want to meet you in new ways, deeper ways. Hear our prayer. Amen. Blessings on you. I've got questions at the end of my notes which are available too for your groups or for you to work through as an individual. And I really do hope you open yourself up to let God speak to you in some brilliantly imaginative and creative ways. And there's a few suggestions there for you to try. Lots of love till next time.